Hale. And now, another Proudly We Hail, one of radio's outstanding dramatic half-hours, starring Lee Tracy, and presented transcribed by your Army and your Air Force. From Radio City, New York, here is your star and host on Proudly We Hail, the distinguished Broadway stage, screen, and radio star, Lee Tracy. Thank you, Kenneth Banghart, and hello, everyone. Welcome again to Proudly We Hail. Our play is entitled Deadly Passage, and we invite you to join the captain and crew of the schooner Mermaid on an ill-fated voyage which meant death for two men and fear and terror for all on board. After Ken Banghart's message, we'll be ready for our first act. Your United States Army has unlimited opportunities for high school graduates. You'll be expertly trained in a useful skill and you'll proudly wear the uniform of your United States Army, known the world over as the mark of a man. Visit your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station for all the details. And now with your star Lee Tracy in the role of Captain Matthew Lincoln, your Army and your Air Force present the proudly we hail production of Deadly Passage. <laughs> Between the boot of the Malay Peninsula and the long snout of Sumatra run the Straits of Malacca. On a bright day in June with a fresh following wind, the schooner Mermaid pounded northward through the Straits under full sail, her course set for Rangoon. On her quarterdeck, her master Matthew Lincoln stood wide-legged with telescope glued to his eye. By his side was the passenger, roly-poly Reverend Nathaniel Fiddler. The Reverend had bought passage at Singapore on his way to the jungles of Burma to spread the word of God amongst the heathens. Now he stood looking at his host with a questioning smile upon his angelic face. I, I, I must say, Captain, you seem to have an uncommon interest in that vessel. Is she overtaking us? Ah, uh, oh, yes, Reverend, I do have an interest in her. I seem to recognize her. Uh, a friend of yours, perhaps, huh? Well, that I can't say. She flies no colors and must... Tales of piracy hereabouts. Uh, well, blessed are the watchful. Is she a schooner? No, nope. Barkentine. The authorities suggested we give all ships of her nature a wide berth. Oh, the hand of Gideon is with us, I'm sure, Captain Lincoln. If this wind holds... Are we uh, being overtaken? Not at present, but if the wind slackens... Oh, it shall not slacken, Captain. I shall catch the ear of the Lord. For how long must it favor us? Till nightfall. Then we can forget about him. Oh, fear not, Captain. I shall ask, and it will be given. Uh, well, I shall depend on you, Reverend. <laughs> uh, fine we pass, Captain. Uh, sea air and prayer gives a man a stout appetite. Mm, indeed it does. Are you sure that you didn't overdo it, though? This wind seems to be blowing up a gale. <laughs> it's possible that I was overzealous. I sometimes get carried away. Well, we thank you anyway. Oh, not at all. Uh, I've had my fill. <sighs> yes, Mr. Murphy? Uh, beg pardon, sir. Wind's after veering into the northeast. Think we'd best be double reefing her and maybe taking in a bit of sail. Do what you think best, Mr. Mate. I'll come above friendly. Aye, Captain. A colorful man, your mate. And a good one to boot. <laughs> if he didn't love the bottle as much as a sea, he'd have his own ship. Ah, pity. Strong drink is the curse of Satan, I always say. I don't, don't you agree, Captain? Oh, yes, 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 of course, yeah. Well, you'll excuse me now, Reverend. Oh, to be sure. Uh, will we have a rough night? It may get a bit rocky, but I'm sure with prayer and sea air you'll weather it. Uh, indeed I shall, Captain. Indeed I shall. We now sail double reef before a quartering wind which is fast reaching gale proportions. Should it hold, the morrow we'll see us weathering the Nicobars and sticking our bowsprit into the Andaman Sea. 
except for catching sight of the barkentine with the aid of the good reverend showing at our stern, the voyage continues uneventful. I shall feel easier, however, when we make Rangoon. Well, it's the rich what gets the gravy. It's the poor what gets the blame. It's the rich that makes the money. Find it all a bleeding shame. Dixon, I like your helmsmanship far more than your voice. Oh, aye, sir. How does she read? Not only savvy, sir. Hold her at that. Aye, aye, sir. Murphy! Aye, Captain! Any report in the forward hold? I've got Perkins and Blake down there. I'll go down myself. You think there's any need, Captain? No, no need, Mr. Murphy. I have no reason to believe the cargo there isn't secure, but with the sea as it is and the wind holding, it's best to take no chances. Aye, Captain. I've noticed that... Ah! Uh, what Wait, order come along! Oh, Noble, who is it? It's Perkins. Wait. Perkins, man, what is it? Captain, save me. Do something. Get hold of yourself, Perkins. What happened? What ails you? Where's Blake? Too late, Captain. Look out. Look out for... Perkins. Painted he has. Murphy, get the bottle in the wardroom. Aye, aye. Lively. Can I be of assistance, Captain? I, I know a little of medicine. Good. He seems to have fainted. Where's Blake? Yes, sir. What the devil happened, man? I'll be a stuffed headache if I'm knowing, sir. I was checking things on the port side of the forward hold, and he on the starboard. All of a sudden, he lets out a great bloody scream, and then another one, and then he's off like a flash up the companionway, hollering like all the banshees in Donegal were after him. I collected me wits and followed. Here's the bottle, sir. I'm afraid it's too late for that. His soul is at rest. What? You mean he's dead? You mean he's dead? dead? Are you are you sure? Yes, Captain. I'm sure. Belay there! Go back to your station. You can do nothing to help Perkins now. But, Captain, he wasn't sick. He was as strong as a bull. What what did he die from? I don't know, Blake. Mr. Murphy, have two men bring Perkins' body down to the ward room. Aye, sir. Put him there. Aye, sir. All right, that'll do. You men may go. Mr. Murphy, see that we're not disturbed. Aye, no, 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 don't go. Just stand there in the companionway. Well, Reverend. Well, Captain. I trust you observed the marks on the calf of Perkins' leg. I did, sir. And that's why I pulled his trouser down over it. Am I correct in supposing that you recognize them? You are, sir. And you? I believe so. I would say they're the fang marks of a deadly poisonous snake, probably a cobra. And unfortunately, I would have to agree with you. Mr. Murphy, you'll go on deck and take charge. I want every man out from below, whether on watch or not. Get them busy doing something until I relieve you. Yes, sir. And may I be asking, sir... What you plan to do? Well, I'm not loading this revolver to shoot fish, Mr. Murphy. And as far as I know, it's the only firearm we have aboard. But, sir, that's dangerous. A cobra... Well, what would you have me do, Mr. Murphy? Order one of the crew down there? No, sir, but I'd be glad to... I'm sure, I'm sure you would. I, I thank you. But you'll serve me best by going topsides and taking charge. I'll search out that forward hold. If I don't come upon it, I'll close the bulkhead anyway and trust that it's trapped in there. Aye, sir. Good luck. Perhaps you'd better stay here, Reverend, in case anyone gets curious. I wouldn't think of it, Captain Minken. I'll carry the lantern and bring the power of the Lord with me. There's no need to risk your life. I have no fear. I put my life in my master's hands. Come. This is the forward hold. Watch your head. 
Ah, Perkins Landon still hanging over there. Be careful, Captain. If you see anything that resembles what we're looking for, don't hesitate to yell. I'll shoot first and worry later. I, uh, I find it a mite warm in here, don't you? As warm as I ever wanted. Well, we can't be sure, but it looks like it's left here. It can be anywhere on the ship. Anywhere. Come along, we'll close the bulkhead door. And now what, Captain Lincoln? And now, Reverend, I tell the crew. If they're going to sail with the Cobra, they have a right to know it. Lee Tracy, starring in the role of Captain Matthew Lincoln in the proudly we hail production of Deadly Passage, will return in just a moment for the second act. Your growing United States Army needs qualified young officers, and a brand new regulation says you can apply for OCS, Officer Candidate School, before you enlist. You must be at least 19 years old and able to pass the mental and physical exams for Army officers. A high school diploma is your best qualification. If you're accepted, you'll take 14 weeks of basic, then go to leadership school for eight weeks and be sent directly to Army OCS. You'll be taught many interesting subjects, and it'll be a great day when you get your commission. You'll be proud to be an officer in the United States Army with good pay and allowances for quarters and food. This is a great opportunity for you young men, and you should take advantage of it now. Young women, too, can apply for officers' candidate school. If you think you can make the grade, get all the details at your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station. You are listening to Proudly We Hail... And now, with your star, Lee Tracy, in the role of Captain Matthew Lincoln, we present the second act of Deadly Passage. I've been confronted by problems and difficulties before, but the problem before me now is as delicate and dangerous as a lighted keg of powder. Somewhere aboard the mermaid lurks a sudden and horrible death. Even as I sit here writing, it might well be creeping upon me. Without arms, we're defenseless against this evil. I've taken every precaution open to us, men to stand watch in the forecastle and the galley when possible, all hands on deck. We changed our course for Georgetown. Should nothing further occur, the crew will stand by my orders. But let this monster strike again, and even the strongest of them may become difficult to control. Tomorrow, after the burial service... I shall have another word with them. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Man, that is born of woman. Men, it's a sad duty we've just performed. But now, knowing our danger, we must all face it calmly and see that it does not happen again. If there's no change in the weather, we'll make Georgetown day after tomorrow. If it improves, we'll all be there all the sooner. I want all hands to remain on deck for the time being. I'm going to search the ship again. If I find nothing, we'll set about rigging traps to catch the snake. We've been in some tight spots before, and I know you'll see this through like the good crew that you are. Now, don't you worry about us, Captain. <laughs> No luck, Captain? None. Let the men off duty and go below. We searched everywhere. Could it have gone overboard? I doubt that. I'll relieve you shortly, Mr. Murphy. Why, sir? Reverend, you've spent a good bit of your life in these parts. Have you got any idea on how to go about trapping a cobra? Well, I've been thinking about that. I've heard it said that a cobra is very fond of milk. Ha <laughs> ha! 
But it'd be fine if we had a cow on board. Nevertheless, a snake must eat. Well, I've thought of that, but you've seen our cargo. There's plenty for it to feed on there. If we put the trap... Captain! It's in the galley! Captain Quinn! What's going Coming! Hi! It's got me trapped! Stay away, you! Stay away! Captain! Don't move, Murphy! Look! Look at the size of the dirty devil. Captain, another second, and I'd have been cold meat. Oh, I'm sorry I didn't get here sooner, Mr. Murphy. For the Lord is merciful. Oh. Amen to that. A better day, Captain. In all ways, Reverend. A changed course for Rangoon again? Aye. A harrowing experience. I prayed mightily. Where do you suppose it had been hiding? Who knows? I'm glad it was a mate who made the discovery. <laughs> Even though it did scare ten years off his life, another man might have run. Speaking of running, your mate seems to be doing just that. Uh, sir, sir, could I be speaking to you right away in private, like... Go ahead, Mr. Murphy. What is it? It's Lopez, sir. He didn't turn to, huh? so I went below to see what ailed him. He was in his bunk, the top one at the far end of the forecastle. He's dead, sir. Dead? How? Just, uh, you, you may think me daft, but I, I noticed his arm was all swole up, and there were some marks on it. I'd say he'd been bitten by one of them great bloody snakes like Perkins. All right, all right, Billy there. The captain has a word to say. Yeah, what's it going to talk? We're sailing with a cargo of blood. Oh. Yeah, what do you think you're doing? Everything's in order, Captain. Men, cobras often travel in pairs. Yeah, now it would seem that we've only gotten rid of one half the danger. We weathered the first half, we'll weather the second. We've changed course for Georgetown again. Off watch men had better sling their hammocks on deck for the time being. Now we all share this common danger. I can understand your feelings as they're my own, but I'll suffer no insubordination. My commands will be obeyed. Mr. Murphy, let all the off-watch men continue to work on the rigging of traps. Use anything you want. Well, yes, what is it? Well, sir, uh, how do we know there's only one more to catch? Isn't two enough for you, man? <laughs> now, that's all I got to say. Keep a weather eye. If you see anything, anything that looks out of place, sing out. The Reverend tells me he has the ear of the Lord, so we'll all pray together that we make port without further incident. You've eaten nothing, Captain. I'm afraid I have no taste for food. Perkins and Lopez, two good men... And, as that fellow said, how do we know there are only two? Hardly well, seems likely there would be more. Reverend, it's hardly likely there'd be one. Still, what do you want, Dixon? I beg your pardon, Captain, sir. Oh, I didn't mean to eat this quiet like, but there's talk going on in the forecastle you should know about. Forecastle, I ordered all hands on deck. Well, some of the lads was uh, down getting their hammocks and the like. Well, what is it? Well, I ain't mentioning the names, Captain, because I ain't the kind that rats, but uh, I figured before things get out of hand like I ought to... All right, all right. Get on with it. Well, sir, some of them are talking about taking to the boats. Uh, got the wind up and getting the wind up in others. Oh, I've seen a thing like this, bread, Captain. One time when I was on That'll the... That'll do, Dixon. Thank you. Get above. I'll handle it. Aye, sir. Uh, if you need any help, just holler. Would you like me to come with you? Thank you, no, Reverend. This is one matter I'll handle alone. I ordered you men on deck. What are you doing here? Oh, one of you speak up. We, we was just getting our duffel, Captain. Right. Does it take this long? Well? No, no, sir. It's come to my attention that some of you proposed taking to the boats. I don't want to know who proposed it. In fact, I want to forget it. Such action without my orders would be considered mutiny. I want no mutiny on this ship. She's a good ship and you're a good crew. Better to take a grip on your courage than to face disgrace in a hangman's noose on a yard arm. All right, now get above. And lively. Right, 
There was a feeling on the mermaid that had never been aboard before. You could almost smell it. It was fear. Thick and suffocating, a fog that blanketed reason and left men thinking of only one thing, escape. And who could blame them? Shortly before dawn, I went below for a catnap. The reverend and all hands were sleeping above deck, but with the door to my cabin, I saw no need to do likewise. I left the binnacle light burning, threw myself down on the bunk. For a time, sleep wouldn't come. Through my mind swam words and shapes and the awful realization that we were not done with deadly peril. When sleep came, it was troubled and filled with the stark edges of nightmare. It may have been the ship's bell that woke me. It may have been a sound, but I awoke suddenly, lay on my back for a moment, unmoving, letting the tide of sleep ebb completely away. Then I turned my head, preparatory to rising, and my eye caught the shadow. Against the far wall it towered, flaring out at the head in hideous relief. It was a monstrous shadow that wove back and forth with a terrible, studied grace. Paralysis struck me, and if a man's blood turns to water in such times, mine did, and then froze. An instant and an eon later, my eyes left the shadow and slid to the floor. The thing reared in the center of the cabin, not five feet from me. Its head nearly level with mine. Its yellow, hate-filled eyes glared at me with hypnotic deadliness, and its ugly forked tongue darted in and out with watchful anticipation. I couldn't move. I couldn't think. I had one consuming desire, and that was to get away. I'd hung my coat on a hook at the head of the bunk. In my right hand pocket lay the revolver. I had only to reach up behind me to grasp it, but it might just as well have been resting on the highest yard arm, for I knew at my first move the cobra would strike. How long I lay like that, there's no telling. When the change came, it was sudden. voice stuck in my throat as I tried to warn him. Then he was standing in the entranceway, door in hand. The cobra, at the first knock, had wheeled to face the sound. It now stood motionless on the verge of striking. The reverend saw it at once. He could have leaped back, slammed the door, perhaps been quick enough, but he didn't move. He stood stock still, his face gone gray. And then he began to sing as though he'd lost his wits. Hold you, fiend of hell, hold you, fiend of hell, Captain, take your time, take your time. Singing has a strange effect on such a reptile as this. Hold you. As the reverend sang, the snake began to weave its head back and forth. Slowly, I edged my arm up behind me. My hand touched the cloth of the coat, then found the pocket. And finally, the cold, welcome touch of metal. I lifted the gun out and carefully aimed it when some movement caught the cobra's eye in a kind of a haze. I saw him whip around and move toward me. Look out, Captain! Captain, do, do you suppose I might have a taste of something spirituous? I... I suddenly feel in the need of of stimulant. Under the circumstances, Reverend, I think it might be arranged. In Rangoon, we bid our passenger farewell, and if ever a captain and his crew felt warmly toward a man, it was that round, smiling little preacher. He'd risked certain death to save me, and by his quick thinking and coolness, I'd come through alive. I shall always be in the debt of the Reverend Nathaniel Archibald Fiddler. May fair winds favor his course. Amen to that. Our star, Lee Tracy, will return in a moment with a word about next week's show. I have an important message for you young men and young women. 
A new United States Army regulation now permits you to apply for OCS, Officer Candidate School, before you enlist. That's right. If you're at least 19 years of age and can meet the physical and mental standards for Army officers, regardless of whether you're a high school graduate, you can go to your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station and volunteer as an officer candidate. You'll take basic training, attend leadership school, and then go to the next available class at OCS. You'll be promoted to corporal when you go to OCS, and upon graduation, you'll become a second lieutenant in the United States Army with good pay and allowances for food and quarters. And remember, young American women have the same opportunity to become officers in the Women's Army Corps. But you'd better act now, for no one knows how long it will be before our growing army has all the officers it needs. Go to your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station and get all the facts today. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented in cooperation with this station by the United States Army and the United States Air Force Recruiting Service. Proudly we hail stars Lee Tracy. Supporting Mr. Tracy as Reverend Fiddler was Bill Lipton. Other members of the cast included Bill Adams, Jeffrey Bryant, and Cliff Owen. Deadly Passage was written by DeWitt Cop. The original music was composed and conducted by John Guarnieri. This program was produced under the supervision of Charles and Rogers Productions and was directed by Charles Wilkes. This is Kenneth Banghart speaking, and here again is your host and star, Lee Tracy. Next week, my friend and colleague, a great star and one of the finest actors in show business, will inaugurate a new series on Proudly We Hail. Mr. Paul Lucas will be with you on these weekly productions, and I'm sure you won't want to miss a single program because... Lee, uh, may I interrupt for a moment? <laughs> Why, of course, Ken. Lee, on behalf of all your friends in the supporting cast, the actors, the musicians, our director, and everyone on the production staff of Proudly We Hail, may we thank you sincerely for the privilege of working with you. And speaking for the United States Army and the United States Air Force Recruiting Service, may I say for them, thanks for a job well done. Thanks for a real service to your country. We'll be looking forward to your return on Proudly We Hail very, very soon. Thank you, Ken. And thanks to everyone, but thanks especially to our listening audience and the local radio stations all over the country who program Proudly We Hail each week. Until next week, then, when Mr. Paul Lucas will be on hand over the same station... This is Lee Tracy saying goodbye.